Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is August 22nd through the 28th, and we are in the Book of Psalms once again. Now, one of the Psalms that stuck out to me this week has to do with the idea of enemies. Now, King David was the one who wrote this Psalm, and I think it's really important to note that King David was a man of war. He was often in battle, right? One of the most well-known stories we have of David is that of him defeating Goliath and the victory of the Israelite army. The Israelites were often surrounded by enemies. King David was a man of war, often surrounded by enemies. I think, judging from what we know about King David, I believe that he knew that the ultimate enemy was unrighteousness and evil doing. However, I believe that some of the Psalms were quite literally praying for deliverance from very real <laughs> mortal enemies that were surrounding Israel. One of these verses, the verse that I want to talk about today, this is Psalms 110, and it is verse 1. It says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So there's one verse in particular that I one phrase in that verse that I want to talk about. Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And I'm actually going to be taking that phrase out of context from the verse because that verse, that phrase was speaking to me a lot this week as I was trying to study. Make thine enemies thy footstool. Often when we are talking about enemies, we're praying for deliverance. We are praying that we won't be captured by enemies, that we won't be overcome by enemies. But this verse is talking about praying that the enemies become the footstool. Now there are many meanings surrounding the footstool. It is often a symbol of dishonor. It's not honorable to be around someone's feet. <laughs> but there are also connotations like humility. And I want to explore a couple of different meanings for this phrase, making the enemies the footstool. The first one, the most obvious one, the footstool and feet, being around someone's feet, cleaning someone's feet was seen as dishonorable. The lowliest servants were the ones who had to clean everybody else's feet, or at least the feet of the master, I guess. And I think this is the most obvious connotation that, that we see when we read a verse like this. The enemies are going to be the footstool. They are going to be the lowest of the low. They are going to get what's coming to them. They are going to receive the justice of God. And we believe in this concept, right? We believe in the justice of God. We believe that those who oppress others in this life will find themselves in circumstances of oppression. We believe in that kind of fairness. And at a cursory glance, I think this is, this is what we see when we read that verse. The enemies will be the footstool. Justice will be served. The enemies will lose. However, I think that there are much deeper meanings at play here in this phrase as well. And interestingly enough, I believe that some of these deeper meanings can actually teach us a lot about ourselves and our own preparedness to live with our Heavenly Father. So, as humans, we often like to look at the world as black and white. So there's good guys, there's bad guys, makes things a lot easier. We see ourselves often as the good guy and there are other good guys like us, but there are also bad guys who are our enemies, right? If we were to create a movie, a very simplified movie of our life or of mortality in general, we would get super, super excited when the good guys flourished and they won and the bad guys got what was coming from them and they lost. What's interesting <laughs> is that if we are truly becoming like our savior, the most joyous times that we should be experiencing, the most joy we should be experiencing is when the bad guys repent. We should yearn for the repentance of our enemies in the same way that we often yearn for our enemies to get what's coming to them, for our enemies to lose, right? We should be yearning for our enemies to change and become the good guys like us. In this way, the footstool can almost be seen as a tool for repentance. We want enough circumstances where our enemies are placed as the footstool so that they can be humbled and repent. 
another concept surrounding this idea of the footstool. None of us want to expel the justice of God, right? We believe in the justice of God. Even though we want our enemies to repent, we know that not everybody is going to repent. And we don't want to completely expel God's justice where it is due. However, our our innermost desires surrounding this idea of the enemies becoming the footstool, it is it can be a really great litmus test for our own spirituality, for how we're doing on our path towards becoming like Jesus Christ. So I want you to think of an enemy, someone who has betrayed you, someone who's hurt you. Think of one of your actual legitimate enemies. Are you excited for the day that they will receive what's coming to them? <laughs> Are you excited for the day when they will reap what they have sown, when they will stand before God and be struck down for what they have done in their lives? I think oftentimes we get proud of ourselves because we have let go of our grievances because we know that God is going to deal with them later. <laughs> and you can kind of hear the problem in those desires, right? Like we should be letting go of our grievances, but not because we know that they're going to get what's coming to them. <laughs> That's not where it should be coming from. We should be letting go of our grievances and hoping that our enemies change, that they become the good guys, that they become our best friends, that they become our brothers and sisters. When we take a step back and we look at the Savior and his stake in mortality, we realize that he wants all of us to win. He wants all of us to be the winners. He wants all of us to be the good guys, even though he knows that that's not always going to be the case. Now, reaching this, this level of charity, right, where we hope for the best for our enemies, where we hope that they become the good guys, it is not an easy point to reach. It is not easy to hope for the prodigal return of your enemies. <laughs> and sometimes I think it's even hard to recognize that we, stu we do still hold grudges and that we aren't loving our enemies, even though we think we're letting go of our grievances, it can be really hard to recognize that our heart is still not, that our heart still needs a little bit of repenting. We can stand back and we can say, yes, I believe in the atonement of Jesus Christ. I believe that it can heal me. I believe that it can pay for everybody's sins. And we can get up and we can bear our testimonies about that. And we can think about our enemy and be like, yes, I believe that the Savior paid for his sins or her sins. However, in the day to day, we are still thinking of their flaws. We're seeking out their flaws. We're still seeing all the negative. When they do something, we're like, oh, it's probably because they're this way. We are seeking out their flaws and then we're being proud of ourselves for being polite to them. It is appropriate to recognize when somebody is toxic and it is there are appropriate times when we cut those people out of our lives. It is appropriate to protect yourself and your family. However, setting those healthy boundaries should also simultaneously come with sincere desires for them to repent and change. Those desires might not come immediately, but that is, that is an ideal that we should be working towards. When we take another look at this verse, we see that we're not just talking about the enemies being placed at the footstool. We are talking about the enemies becoming the footstool. And I think that this is incredibly significant. Often when I've heard testimonies or when I've heard someone talking about Heavenly Father, how Heavenly Father took care of them, I've often heard the idea that a person was placed in their life at exactly the time that they needed them. That they were in some kind of situation and this person showed up and was exactly what they needed and helped them. I believe in this. <laughs> I believe that this happens, right? I believe that Heavenly Father sends us to each other to help each other out. I also believe <laughs> that just as often we have people placed in our lives to help us become better people, 
that force us to choose to become better people and not because they're being a good influence and not because they're treating us wonderfully and we want to be loving like them, but because they are giving us an opportunity to step up and be like Christ. Our enemies can be a stepping a stepping stool, <laughs> a footstool. You can step up, take that opportunity. They're placing a footstool before you where you can step up and become more like your Savior, Savior Jesus Christ. They're giving you an opportunity to practice being like Christ, to practice loving your enemies. These difficult moments <laughs> will appear before you as a stool. Unfortunately, sometimes when that happens, I think we cry out in the unfairness of it all. And we cry to our Heavenly Father and talk about how unfair it is and how hard it is. Not realizing that that stool can be a gift. <laughs> Not realizing that the stool that the enemy placed or the enemy that was placed in our lives can be a stool. We kick that stool away and we're upset about it, not recognizing what a beautiful opportunity it is to feel closer to our Savior Jesus Christ and to become more like our Jesus Christ, to become more like our Savior Jesus Christ. We also forget how so often we get to be the stepping stone the stepping stool for somebody else, the footstool for somebody else, where we come in and we cause a problem and we're difficult and they have to also choose to step up. And this is especially difficult when this is an enemy that is continuing your life, right? We are receiving continual opportunities to step up, to continue to choose charity and love and forgiveness. We're often taught from a young age that when we have an inappropriate thought come to our mind, we need to replace it as quickly as possible with something good. I think that we should also be doing this practice when it comes to how we think about our enemies. When we are talking back, in, talking back to them in our heads or when we're coming up with the perfect rebuttal or when we're thinking about how they wronged us and how we're right and how fair it is, how unfair it is and how unfair they're being. We should be recognizing those thoughts actively, consciously recognizing those thoughts and replacing them with kinder thoughts. Replacing them with the understanding that other people have bad days and that other people have a lot of repenting to do, just like you do. And recognizing that you might not be so different if you had been placed in the same situation as them, right? That is how your enemy becomes your footstool. How your enemy becomes a stepping stone for you to become more like your Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, anything ugly or mean or terrible that happens to us or anything terrible that we do can become beautiful, beautiful, like a footstool that we can step upon to become like our Savior Jesus Christ. And this is very difficult to do. <laughs> First of all, it's really difficult to recognize when you haven't completely forgiven somebody. It's really difficult to recognize when your thoughts are centered on justice being served to your enemies and on how they're being unfair versus recognizing when something is wrong, but also hoping for the best for your enemy. It's really hard to recognize that and to discern that within yourself. It's even harder to replace those thoughts with thoughts of compassion all the time. This is an ideal that I'm teaching <laughs> and I'm not teaching it from, from my high horse. Let me tell you, as I've been pondering this and writing this, I've seen plenty of my own grievances and plenty of them that are quite petty. Forgiveness is not a singular event. It is, it's a journey. <laughs> it is a process. And you have to look at 
each of these unfair things happening to you as more and more stepping stones on this process of becoming like our Savior Jesus Christ. Sometimes people are placed in our lives because we need them. Sometimes we need them because we need to change. Sometimes those people won't change. Sometimes they will continually choose evil, but perhaps they weren't placed in your life so that they could change. Perhaps they were placed in your life so you could change. I believe that repentance, that forgiveness is repentance. Forgiveness is repentance. Forgiveness is about you changing. It's not about the other person changing. It's not about it. That's really what it is. <laughs> Forgiveness is personal repentance. It's you becoming more like your Savior, Jesus Christ. It is meant for you to be stepping up. I believe that this is an expectation of our Savior, Jesus Christ, when we've made promises with him. I also believe that there are lots of things out there, lots of bad things that have happened that I do not comprehend, that I don't understand, because I have been immensely blessed in my life. I believe that therapy and doctors and lots and lots and lots of time are part of this repentance process for the victim. And when I say repentance for the victim, I'm not saying that the victim has done anything wrong. Please note that that is not what I'm trying to say. Because to me, repentance is healing. It is the process by which you become like your Savior, Jesus Christ. And because you're becoming like Jesus Christ, you are bringing more power into your life. You're bringing more peace into your life. And isn't that what we all want for the victims that we know? I believe that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, everyone can change. I believe that even victims can change to become powerful and healed. And I believe that as we, as that healing comes, as we continually turn towards our Savior, <clears throat> I believe as that healing comes, and as we learn little bit by little bit, day by day, therapy appointment by therapy appointment, if that's what it takes, as we come to realize how loved we are and how important we are and how valid we are, that forgiveness is going to come because you won't need to hang on to that pain anymore, pain that has been afflicted upon you. I believe that it can come through doctors and therapy. <clears throat> but more than anything else, I believe that it comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And often it comes all together. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.